Hello, it's Scott Manley here. One of Europe's biggest projects in space is the Galileo Satellite Network. It is a navigation system which is very much equivalent to GPS and in theory will provide one meter navigation resolution for most users or one centimeter to paying customers. Right now, there's about 20 satellites deployed in orbits that are 23,200 kilometers up and in a 56 degree inclination. Now, of course, they work very much in the same way as GPS. That is, they have very accurate clocks on board and they have very accurate uh, orbital determination. The clocks they use are hydrogen masers, which of course use the 1.42 gigahertz spin, molecular spin transition. Uh, they also have backup rubidium clocks as well. Of course, for the orbit uh, determination, they include things such as retro reflectors so that the ground stations can shine lasers and bounce them off them. And because the satellites now know their orbits with great precision, uh, they can transmit that. Ground stations, of course, can pick these up, ground receivers, can pick up these orbital elements and given the times that are transmitted down they can very accurately figure out the location. The cluster began being launched in 2011 with a pair of satellites. 2012 saw another pair of test satellites and the scientists then worked for some time to make sure that they were operating as expected on orbit before beginning the proper deployment with satellites 5 and 6. These were launched on board a Soyuz launch vehicle out of Kourou in South America. It was, uh, of course, sent into an injection orbit with an apogee of 23,200 kilometers, and then they would use a frigate upper stage to circularize it. Unfortunately, after this, uh, after the circularization, they uh, looked at the orbits and they realized the orbits were way off what they were ex expected. They had, uh, they ended up going to orbits with like a perigee of 13,700 and an apogee of 25,900, which was just totally not usable. Uh, what had happened was the forget upper stage had a bit of a design flaw where a hydrazine fuel line ran very close to a helium pressurant line and the, bra the aluminium bracket that held them in place conducted you know, thermally and caused the hydrazine to freeze inside the fuel line. This apparently stopped the reaction control thrusters from working for a period and so the spacecraft rotated to a point where its gyroscopes or gimbals locked and therefore it lost its orientation in space. This wasn't realized and then when it tried to perform its burn into, into put it into an orbit, it essentially fired at more or less a random orientation. They were fortunate, I guess, that it didn't send them back into the Earth's atmosphere. So uh, yeah, the satellites were not left in a useful orbit. In particular, when the satellite came down to the closest point, its antenna tracking hardware was unable to track the Earth because what they did was they would look for the shape of the Earth and the field of view in the sensor was too narrow to see the entire Earth. So they did manage to use the onboard station keeping fuel to raise up the perigee and put it into a slightly less eccentric orbit with a perigee of like um, 17,000 kilometers and an apogee of about 25,800, um, you know, difference of about 8,500 kilometers. And so they were able to get, make the satellite operate. They were able to use the sensors to orient this, the antenna correctly. But of course, they weren't really in the correct orbit and not every, you know, they weren't, they weren't used basically as regular satellites. They are available for people that want to use them as uh, positioning, but generally if you have a, a Galileo receiver, it will not use those most of the time or at all. However, because these spacecraft were on eccentric orbits, they would fall down into Earth's gravity well and pick up speed. And then as they moved outwards, they would lose speed and go further away. Now there's two effects in general relativity that they would experience. One is the gravitational redshift. That is the deeper you go inside a gravity well, the slower the clock runs compared to observers outside. Similarly, the faster you move, the slower your clock appears to run to external observers. Now these spacecraft, of course, they have very, very accurately determined orbits thanks to laser rangefinders on the 
bolted to the spacecraft, but they also carried these incredibly accurate clocks that were required for the navigation. These clocks are accurate to something like one second in three million years. And so by observing these clocks in these pair of spacecraft, the scientist figured out that they would be able to get a more accurate test of general relativity. Einstein, of course, did all his work in general relativity using pencil and paper. He was entirely theoretical. He didn't make experiments. The experiments have, of course, subsequently continuously proved that he was right. But the scientists, of course, wanted to see just how right he was. So yeah, they observed these clocks and it was seen that between perigee and apogee, there's a discrepancy of about 350 nanoseconds. Um, so 350 nanoseconds does not sound like a very large number, but remember how these satellites work, how they provide, how, they, how you determine your location on the Earth is by measuring the distance to these satellites. And you do this by measuring the time signal and the speed of light. So if your time signal is off by 350 nanoseconds, one nanosecond at the speed of light is about 30 centimeters. So yeah, 350 is about 100 meters discrepancy if general relativity is not correct. Well, it turns out that when they plug the numbers in and test it, the uh, got a result that showed that general relativity, as predicted by Albert Einstein, exactly matches the observed variance in their clocks to within 0.0019%, right? Now that's five times better than any previous measurement. In fact, the previous measurement was made in the 1970s using a spacecraft called Gravity Probe A. This wasn't even a satellite. This was another hydrogen maser clock, which was launched on a suborbital trajectory using a Scout rocket. It went up to 10,000 kilometers on a two hour flight and then fell back and splashed down in the ocean. That got, you know, that got a really good result pretty much proving Einstein was right. But yeah, in this case, this was not designed to run this experiment, but it just happened to have all the hardware and be an exceptionally good test bed for this. So yeah, the Gal Galileo cluster in general is continuing to get built out. They're launching new spacecraft and they're continuing to add to their capabilities. These two oddballs, they are being used by scientists. They can be used by people that want, you know, special features or whatever for their navigation. They do actually work as part of the regular uh, emergency beacon system broadcast. You, so they can l search and rescue. Yeah, they'll work in search and rescue mode. That is, if you have one of these special beacons, you can activate it and the, sa the satellites will pick it up and try to figure out your location and notify emergency services. <laughs> if you're in the middle of the ocean, I'm not sure what your local emergency services are, but hey, the at least Galileo will pick it up and relay it to people who might be able to do something about it. So this is just a fine example of scientists being able to get good data out of a bad system. And so, yeah, I mean, scientists always looking for opportunities to do science with whatever's made available to them. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.